St. Louis, Missouri, 1983, two men would be rummaging through an abandoned apartment building when they would find a horrifying discovery. The body of a young girl found in a state that would not only horrify the two individuals, but also investigators and the entire city of St. Louis. The murder would go down as one of the most heinous and horrifying crimes in the city's history, a crime that haunts investigators today, as even the newest investigators are desperate to solve it, and to give the young girl her name back. This is Midwest Mystery Files, Episode 4, The St. Louis Jane Doe. Hello everyone, welcome back to Midwest Mystery Files. I'm your host Jeremiah, with just a few quick notes before we start. Midwest Mystery Files is a bi-weekly true crime podcast focused on missing and murdered cases within the Midwestern region of the United States. We can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Audible, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. Just a quick disclaimer, today's case involves violent acts being committed against a child. Listener discretion is advised. February 28th, 1983. It was a mild winter day, and two men would be driving through a neighborhood in the northwestern part of St. Louis, Missouri, when their car would suddenly break down. The men would find they needed a metal pipe to fix the vehicle, and with no automotive parts store in the immediate vicinity, they resorted to searching through the abandoned buildings that occupied the area. Their search would lead them to 5635 Clemens Avenue, an old Victorian-style building which had housed apartments, but now sat empty. The men rummaged through the main floor, but would be unsuccessful in their search. It was at this point that the men entered the basement. Too dark to see, one of them pulled out a cigarette lighter and flicked it. The flame would light up the darkened basement, but would also expose a gruesome sight. There lying on her stomach was the body of an African-American female, the only clothing on the body being a yellow, blood-stained sweater. Her hands were bound behind her back with a red and white nylon rope, her fingers painted with a double coat of chipped crimson red fingernail polish. Where her neck was supposed to be, only a hole remained. Her head had been removed. Soon, the building would be teeming with police. When investigators first arrived on the scene, they assumed the victim was a sex worker or maybe a drug addict from the nearby Caban courts a housing project where violent murders weren't exactly an uncommon thing. When crime scene technicians would turn the body over, however, the mood in the basement would turn even grimmer. The victim's body showed no signs of puberty. This wasn't an adult victim. This was a child. Investigators flew into high gear. A 16-block radius was searched for any sign of the young girl's head. At the same time, investigators Herb Riley and Joe Burgoon rushed back to the office and started searching through every missing person's case in their database. They thought there was no possible way this young girl hadn't been reported missing. A parent, maybe an aunt or an uncle, would call before the end of the night. They were going to know this young girl's name and complete a list of suspects. Unfortunately, the search for both the head and the search through missing persons' cases would garner no results. She would lie in the morgue for a little over a week, unclaimed before being designated as a Jane Doe. Almost all known information about Jane Doe was learned during that week. The medical examiner concluded that she was between the ages of 8 to 11 years old and that she was big for her age, most likely coming in at 4 foot 10 when she was still alive. Some reports indicate that she may have had spina bifida occulta, which is when a baby's spine does not fully form during pregnancy. It's unknown if she would have shown any outward signs of this. She had been sexually assaulted, and due to a lack of any injuries on the body, was most likely killed by strangulation. Her head had been removed with extreme precision, most likely to make identification from her face or dental records impossible. Detectives concluded that due to a lack of blood at the crime scene, her head had most likely been removed elsewhere. Mold around the wound indicated she had been in the basement for several days. Despite such little information available, investigators remained determined. Detectives Riley and Burgoon began checking school attendance records, looking for students no longer on the rolls. Only the St. Louis Public Schools kept computerized attendance records at the time, but even those lists lacked information as to where a student went after leaving school. It was strenuous work. For every child accounted for, there were several more to find. The detectives would make call after call until they were located. After approximately seven months, 
The detectives accounted for every 8 to 11 year old black female enrolled in St. Louis City Schools and the neighboring districts of University City, Wellston, Ferguson, and Normandy. Nothing. Jane Doe was still a mystery. Captain Leroy Atkins, the first African American head of homicide in the St. Louis Police Department, immersed himself in the case and the community. Well aware that relations between the black residents and the police department were strenuous at best, he wanted to make sure the community knew how dedicated he was to solving the case. Atkins organized meetings in the black community, urging residents to help, as well as wrote letters to the St. Louis American, Ebony, and Jet magazines. His efforts, however, would be in vain. Nobody knew who little Jane Doe was. Jane Doe would stay in the morgue for months, with investigators hoping against hope she would be identified. Finally, on a gloomy day in December 1983, she was buried in Washington Cemetery in North St. Louis County. At the funeral were a few homicide detectives, the chief medical examiner, and a half dozen news reporters. Four grave diggers would serve as pallbearers. While the burial had occurred, police still had the case to search. Unfortunately, they were around 10 months cold at this point, and the case was growing colder by the day. A few potential leads would filter in those first couple years, all of them leading nowhere. In a December 2004 article from the Riverfront Times, Detective Burgoon recalls a time a frantic woman ran into a St. Louis police station claiming to have met the potential killer. The woman stated a man who lived not far from the abandoned Victorian building had invited her into his apartment, where he showed her a machete and a human skull. Thinking they may have their first potential lead, Leroy Atkins, Herb Riley, and Joe Burgoon wasted no time arriving at the apartment, sledgehammer in hand which was used to bust the door open. The rush that they may have had their killer would soon deteriorate, however. Burgoon recalls, quote, The machete was a novelty piece. You could bend it a million ways. It could never cut someone's head off. And he got the skull from his high school teacher in California. It was all verified. He wasn't our guy. The Times also reports that a tip was called in from Charlac, a small town in St. Louis County. A Charlac police officer would confiscate a skull from a storage locker in hopes that it could belong to the young girl. The owner of the storage locker informed the officer he had purchased the skull in the 1970s, and that it belonged to a young indigenous woman who had been killed by a tomahawk. It would later be verified by a forensic anthropologist to be too old to be the skull they were looking for. Another potential suspect would appear in 1986, when Vernon Brown would be arrested and charged in the murder of nine-year-old Janet Perkins. In October of 1986, Perkins was walking home from school on a path that took her directly past Vernon Brown's residence in North St. Louis. Brown, who had already spent time in jail for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl in the 1970s, enticed Janet into his home, locked his two stepsons in their room, and proceeded to rape Janet in the basement before strangling her with a rope. Investigators would find her body in two trash bags in a dumpster located behind Brown's home. After his arrest, Brown would confess to Janet's murder, as well as the murder of 19-year-old Sonetta Ford in 1985. Brown had been working under an alias in Ford's apartment when he strangled Ford with an electrical cord before stabbing her in the chest and throat. With the violent nature of Brown's crimes, investigators thought there may be a connection between Brown and the St. Louis Jane Doe. Brown would be questioned about the murder, but would deny any involvement. After the interview, investigators would never name him an official suspect in the murder. Vernon Brown was executed in 2005. Other tips would come and go, but no solid leads would come from them. In 1994, investigators would try a new direction. Investigators Burgoon and Atkins agreed to appear on Sightings, a nationally syndicated television show that dealt with the supernatural. The idea was to connect them with a so-called psychic in Florida who claimed they would be able to enter the mind of Jane Doe. However, the psychic would have to touch something. In what I can only call a baffling move, investigators mailed the bloody sweater and nylon rope found with Jane Doe to the psychic. This would prove to be a mistake, as somewhere in the process the evidence would disappear and never be returned. It is now considered to be lost in the mail. The only pieces of evidence outside of Jane Doe's body are seemingly gone forever. While I didn't say much about my feelings on psychics and police investigations last episode, I think I made my opinion clear with what little I did say, and situations like this are why I tend to feel that way. 
However, that's not what this episode is about, so I will carry on. I couldn't pin down an exact year, but another lead reported in the 2004 Riverfront Times article would come in the form of Sharon Nolte. Nolte was a Kansas City insurance investigator who did her own investigation for seven years on the case of St. Louis Jane Doe before contacting detectives. Nolte claimed that Jane Doe was a young indigenous Chippewa girl named Shannon Johnson and that her killer was a drifter living in Texas. She would claim her investigation took her to a reservation in Minnesota where she collected sample DNA from a woman she believed to be related to Jane Doe. She even claimed to have visited the killer, inviting herself into his home and collecting DNA evidence in his bathroom. Nolte would go on to have the DNA from the woman in Minnesota tested against Jane Doe. The results would come back negative. They were not a match. Despite this fact, Nolte would maintain that she was right and the St. Louis Police Department refused to take her seriously. She would go on to tell the Riverfront Times, I don't give a rat's ass about the police department. I think they stink. I told them who she was and who killed her, and they never did anything with it. I had a bag full of the killer's pubic hair. Do you know how difficult it is to collect a bag full of pubic hair? End quote. Detective Bragoon would tell the Times he was happy to hear what Nolte had to say, stating, quote, You don't want to play anyone cheap. In a case as tough as this one, you want to listen to what anyone has to say. What do you have to lose? End quote. However, he would go on to say that the story just didn't add up, and with a negative DNA match, there just wasn't any solid evidence to go on. This would be the last major movement in the case for some time. In 2009, St. Saint- Louis police detective Tom Carroll requested to have Jane Doe's remains exhumed. Unfortunately, it would not be easy. In 1991, former Washington Cemetery owner Virginia Younger took her own life after the Missouri State Attorney's Office sued her for neglect and mismanagement after they discovered the burial records were inaccurate, remains were missing, bodies were being buried on top of each other, and bones were sticking out of the ground. After her death, The cemetery quickly fell into disarray and became a dumping ground for people's trash. When digging for Jane Doe's body began, investigators would find three bodies buried at her marker, none of which were hers. Turns out, in 1984, some students from Illinois had raised money for a headstone for Jane Doe. The stone would read, The saddened hearts were healed in knowing the pain of life is over and the beauty of the soul revealed. However, due to cemetery mismanagement, it had been placed in the wrong location. Undeterred by this unfortunate revelation, investigators were bound and determined to find Jane Doe. However, the medical examiner would not authorize another dig until investigators were sure they had the correct spot. As luck would have it, though, the invested efforts of those outside the police would lead to her discovery. In March of 2013, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch would release an article on the search for Jane Doe and the efforts of some locals to restore the Washington Cemetery, hopefully finding Jane Doe's location in the process. Within the article were two photos from the day of when she was buried. A reader of the article would show it to his niece, Abby Stylenow, a research associate in the Media and Machines Lab within the Department of Computer Sciences and Engineering at Washington University. Abby and a few of her fellow researchers would track down Ed Sadej, a former photographer for the St. Louis Globe Democrat, who had taken the pictures from the burial. As luck would have it, he still had the negatives from that day. Using the photographs, negatives, and aerial images from the U.S. Geological Survey, they concluded that Jane Doe was located just to the left of a tree that had not existed at the time of her burial. They were correct. Jane Doe had been found and in June of 2013, her body was finally exhumed. Researchers from the University of North Texas and the Smithsonian Institute would run normal DNA tests on the body, mostly confirming information already known to investigators. However, isotope testing would reveal a little bit more. Isotope testing is, as I can best explain it, the testing of minerals in DNA that would have been obtained through drinking water in whatever region the individual may have resided, In Jane Doe's case, isotopic testing showed that Jane Doe had lived at least most of her life in one of the following southeastern states. Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, Tennessee, and North and South Carolina. While not giving them a great deal of information, 
it was more than investigators already had. As Detective Dan Fox would go on to tell the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, quote, When you're working with nothing, and you go from considering that she could be from anywhere in the entire world to a six to eight state range, that's helpful. End quote. A media blitz into the aforementioned states would take place soon after. The idea was that there may still be someone in one of those states who knew who this little girl was, and they would hopefully be willing to come forward. Their efforts, however, would yield little results. In February of 2014, Jane Doe would be reburied at Calvary Cemetery in the Garden of Innocence, a section of the cemetery exclusively for unnamed individuals. Her stone was moved as well, and now sits, waiting for the day a name is finally able to grace it. The case has sat colder than ever for the last eight years, but investigators have refused to give up on the unidentified girl who would go on to also be known as Hope Doe and Little Jane Doe. In 2019, the St. Louis police started a unit focused solely on cold cases. And while several cases have been solved, the identity of Jane Doe and her murderer still eludes them. However, she remains their top priority. Throughout my readings, a lot of articles would show a photo of a box full of Jane Doe's case files. According to Fox 2 Now in St. Louis, there is now a whole room dedicated to the young girl. Lieutenant Scott Apuchan, the head of St. Louis Metro Homicide, believes there is still someone out there who knows something. He told Fox 2 Now in 2020, quote, An 8, 9, 10, or 11-year-old girl doesn't go missing without people taking notice. We are now 37 years later, and I think if anyone was reluctant before to talk, now is the time to come forward. If anyone knows a little girl, maybe a family member, who they suddenly lost track of and disappeared, we want to know. We are interested in anything. End quote. The St. Louis Jane Doe is a very frustrating and horrifying case to look at. In a perfect world, we'd like to think after 38 years, there would be a number of theories to look at, especially one where investigators have stayed invested at the level that they have. But the unfortunate fact of the matter is, there really aren't any. Jane Doe was found in a location that was most likely different from where she was killed. She didn't match any missing person that investigators were able to check on at the time. And worst of all, her head had been removed, making it impossible to check her dental records or to identify her by a photo. DNA has been taken and put into several databases, and while that has ruled her out as being a number of missing girls, it has yet to hit a match on any known relative. As far as what we've been able to take a look at, we have Vernon Brown and the story from Sharon Nolte. We'll start with Vernon Brown. The man who lured nine-year-old Janet Perkins into his home and then raped and murdered her in 1986. At face value, I can see where investigators saw the potential connection. But once you remove the fact that both victims were young, African-American girls with whom the murderer had sexually assaulted, all other comparisons quickly go away. Jane Doe was hidden away in an abandoned building in a dark basement. The fact she was discovered at all was really pure happenstance. The killer most likely knew it was a long shot she would be found. The killer also took the extra step of removing her head. And, while he may have had a proclivity for decapitation, I do find it more likely it was done to make identification that much harder. While I'm not saying our culprit was an evil genius, he clearly was careful, and knew what needed to be done to lower their chances of being caught. Now, let's take a look at Vernon Brown. I have no quarrels about insulting a guy like him, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that he was a complete moron and took absolutely zero steps to not get caught. Neighbors reported seeing Brown and Tice Perkins into his home. His poor stepsons heard everything while locked in their room, and then he disposed of Janet's body in a dumpster behind his house, never thinking for a minute that he was already a registered sex offender and his door was the first one in that area that was going to be knocked on. He was also quick to confess to Sonetta Ford's murder after his arrest, while still denying any involvement in Jane Doe's murder. Is it possible he killed Jane Doe? Sure. Is it likely? Probably not. The M.O. just doesn't add up. Next, you have Shannon Nolte's story about Jane Doe being a Chippewa girl named Shannon Johnson. She even got DNA from a woman she believed to be a relative. And she even went as far as visiting who she suspected to be the killer in his own home and collecting his DNA. This is a hard theory to look at, as we don't really know how Sharon collected all the information and came to the conclusions that she did to, to track down these people. 
We really just have what she told investigators. As far as a missing girl named Shannon Johnson, I couldn't find anyone who has been missing since at least the 80s with that name. Now, Sharon did claim that Shannon Johnson was an indigenous girl, and I could fill a whole episode on how missing indigenous women and girls are both underreported and underinvestigated, but that's best saved for a case more focused on that topic. I'm just saying for now that there very well could be a missing Chippewa girl named Shannon Johnson from that time, and there just unfortunately is no record of her. But if that is indeed the case, and Sharon Nolte did indeed track down a relative of hers, the DNA just didn't match to Jane Doe, and she is not Shannon Johnson. As far as what investigators think, they believe Jane Doe probably knew her murderer, and due to a lack of her being reported missing, she was unfortunately most likely related to them. Some investigators believe that wherever she did disappear from, she was most likely taken care of. She seemed to be healthy, and someone had taken the time to paint her nails. I have to side with investigators here. It really does just seem like the most likely scenario. Outside of family, I can maybe theorize that she may have been a foster child lost in the system somewhere, which could also account for a lack of reporting on her as a missing child. It is interesting that the state of Missouri did not show up in Jane Doe's isotope testing. However, Arkansas and Tennessee both border Missouri, so it wouldn't have been that far for someone to move the body to St. Louis, especially if they were familiar with the area and knew where they wanted to dump her. It would have just been another move to make it that much harder to identify her. When I first started planning for this podcast, I knew right away that the St. Louis Jane Doe was a case I wanted to cover. It has stuck with me since the first time I ever read about it. A young girl is murdered, and to add insult to injury, her head is removed. She is then buried with no one there other than investigators who swore to bring her to justice, a few members of the press, the priest, chief medical examiner, and the grave diggers who would serve as her pallbearers. Her grave is then neglected and lost for several years, and now, after 38 years, she remains unidentified. It's a horrifying and sad fate for anyone, let alone a child. Before leaving Jane Doe's funeral in 1983, Detective Herb Riley told the press, quote, I've been involved with her since the day she was found, and I'll be damned if I'm going to stop looking for her killer. Words he would live by long past retirement until his death in 1996. He never stopped looking the case over. It was only one of two that he was never able to solve. As far as I can tell, every detective handed her case has lived with that same mentality. And in the internet age, a slew of podcasters, bloggers, Reddit users, and YouTubers have kept her case alive as well. Now... I ask you as listeners, if this is the first time you've heard about this case, or the tenth, I encourage you to share this podcast, any other podcasts, or blogs you might know of. If you live in any of the states her isotope testing came back from, ask your neighbors, family, or friends if they remember a young African-American girl who played in the neighborhood and then disappeared one day. Because you never know, it could have been her. 38 years is a long time. But older does have been identified, and in some cases, their killers even caught. It's not too late for us to find this girl justice and give her her name back. If you have any information on the St. Louis Jane Doe, please contact the St. Louis Police Department at 314-444-5822, or the St. Louis City Medical Examiner Office at 314-622-4971. If you're looking for any further information on the St. Louis Jane Doe, there is a slew of podcasts, blogs, and newspaper articles on the case. If you want to let me know what you think happened, or you just want to follow the podcast on social media, you can find me on Twitter at Files Midwest, Instagram at Midwest Mystery Files, and Facebook at Midwest Mystery Files. You can also email me case suggestions, questions, or comments at Midwest Mystery Files Pod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you like what you hear, please leave a rating or review. This will help the podcast show up on searches as well as give these cases more exposure. And thank you to all those who have done so already. Thank you all for listening, and I will see you all again in two weeks.